Hey everyone, and welcome back to uh, week four. We'll talk about some ideas here that will maybe guide you through some of our considerations, the readings, the media, some of the topics you might consider either in your text or open discussions. And again, in the anthropology of music and sound, hopefully you're bringing your passions to this class and really considering things as you relate to the topics for the week. So with anything, uh, that we consider this week, like in all weeks, think about how do you relate to the topics here, ethnomusicology, methods, and music and performance settings. So we'll start off with ethnomusicology and methods. And I want to mention that if you get a chance, you can look at some of the background materials, particularly this value of research. And the value of research is really talking about my expertise as a cultural anthropologist, doing a lot of research in pop culture, not studying music per se, sometimes the, the senses as they connect with music and sound, but doing things like going to theme parks and looking at culture and how culture is presented or represented uh, or re even represented, if you will, in another version from a previous form or format. So you can look at this article because I think it'll really maybe help you guide an, an understanding of what cultural anthropologists and ethnomusicologists do. You might think of some of these research goals to apply even to your own project here in the uh, class as we think about final projects. So definitely check out this article in the reading for the week. You can also look at this handout. This handout really gives you a sense of the different approaches in, say, the natural sciences versus the social sciences. We tend to focus more on field work and field methods in cultural anthropology, not unlike folklore, maybe psychology, certain, certainly sociology. And that involves things like interviews, what we call participant observation, where you actually live with the people that you're studying Studying, which would be very important for those of you doing interviews or working with people on their musical tastes or performance and maybe doing many interviews, getting a field recorder, which could also be your phone, and recording interviews um, from performers to better understand a musical genre or a particular song or performance approach. Because we work with humans and real people, we often get involved in doing what we call human subject review to make sure that no harm comes to the people that we work with and study. And sometimes we're bound, this has happened to me with corporations where I've been a consultant, I'm bound what's, by what's called an NDA or non-disclosure agreement. So it means like you might go and work for Google and maybe a company that does something with music or sound, but you sign an agreement saying you cannot take any of the trade secrets that you are um, working with or come in contact with with you and uh, publish those or reveal those. You can be sued heavily for this kind of stuff because, of course, corporations are very much trying to protect um, their interests, uh, particularly if those involve trademarks and things that are registered and so forth. Um, and it'd be interesting to think about this in the context of music and how maybe music technology or even recording approaches could be forcing you to be bound by those agreements if you work for companies or recording studios even that are engaged in musical and sonic work. So we'll think about methods this week. Right now we'll jump into what we call ethnomusicology methods. And again, ethnomusicology refers to the study of non-Western music in cultural context. A lot of my expertise comes from my work taking graduate courses as an undergraduate when I was there at um, Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. And as I've mentioned in some of these videos, I also worked at the Archives of Traditional Music, doing work with sound, recording, archiving that sound in the archives, and then uh, working with uh, various musicians in a performance series that I organized for a number of years through the Archives of Traditional Music. So I really wanted to get embedded in taking ethnomusicology classes because so few programs across the world offer this specialized field of, of study. Um, I took a specific class called uh, Transcription Analysis of Traditional Music, and it was taught in the, um, again, the ethnomusicology program. Often these were also cross-listed as an F class, a folklore class. I won't get into what folklore is, but there's a lot of relationships between folklore and cultural anthropology. And folklore is probably one of the most unique PhD programs I've experienced. There are very few folklore prog programs across the country, as there are very few ethnomusicology programs across the country. If you're interested, I can give you some tips on the big programs. Uh, UT Austin, University of Washington, UCLA, Indiana University, Columbia all have really great big ethnomusicology programs. So be happy to talk to you about any of those. And I know some folks who teach in a few of those programs at least. 
So this just shows you the syllabus from the class and the readings. The readings actually are similar to some of the readings we're doing today. Um, reading some of the folks like Bruno Nettle, which is a classic, we're actually reading or it's an option to read for this week in our class. So it's, it's kind of interesting to think that these classics have stuck with us all, all throughout these years. This shows you a little bit about our, our assignments. So for every week we had to do a transcription. So a transcription refers to taking a song, and this is an example of it here, talking about a music activity. And I love this because we were actually working with um, Apple computers at the time, very early forms of Apple computers. This was back in 1988, and using things called image writers, which are old printers. And I remember it was my very first time ever in my life using a mouse. And I sat down in front of this computer, and it was during this exercise that we were doing. And um, I remember we had the mouse, and it was, of course, on a cord, and we're all looking at it. And it was almost like the mouse in that old Star Trek film with the um, time travel, Star Trek IV, where um, one of the uh, um, members of the Enterprise talks into the mouse. They don't know how to use it. We literally were looking at this thing. We're like, what the heck is this? How do we use it? And there was this fear. But what's funny to me is like we were using technology at that, those times that we thought was as current as the technology that we use today or I use today in teaching this class or in doing my music performance or whatever. So it kind of sticks with me that, you know, we were using technology, but back in 88, let me tell you, so different than the technology that we are using today, of course. So a lot of our assignments involve what we call transcription. So we would um, get a, a sheet here that would describe what the example was. We were often told to listen to it, and I wish I had photos of all the great sonic devices we had access to there and like the listening library because you know we had record players that would play at different speeds so we were told to listen at that particular speed and then we could slow that down Re listen to it at a slower speed whether it was um uh, you know a tape recorder or another device like a record player there were even wax cylinders at the Archives of Traditional Music, and definitely check out, when we talk about technology in this class, check out Wax Cylinders, a really revolutionary technology that is over, over 100 years, really more, more than 100 years old. And it's kind of cool because we were really forced to listen closely to a song, use the technology available, and then, as you can see here, slow down the um, transcription or slow down the recording to see if you can transcribe different things. And then here, it says, start the transcription on a B-flat, a second below, middle C. Do not try to transcribe the text. And so very often, what you'd have to do is use your ear to really try to understand the intervals. And if you've ever done sight singing like I did in my um, music classes, my music theory classes as an undergraduate, I found it very hard. What would happen in sight singing is the um, music instructor would play a C for you, say on a keyboard. And then they would say, now um, sing the third, sing the fifth, sing the seventh. Um, and it gets really tricky, you know, if it's, if, if it's the flat um, seven or something like that. But usually, you know, I could sing like the third, which if it was a C that was played, the third um, on the major scale would be an E. And then the fifth would be a G on the C major scale. But it was really hard for me because I've never been an ear guy. I've always been someone... Um, great with reading music and working with music and scores and coming up with with songs and melodies but i've never been one of those persons who i certainly you know with per, i don't have perfect pitch and those of you that might have perfect pitch in this class congratulations use it appropriately because it's a great uh technique and skill to be able to have but for me, doing these transcriptions, it was super hard because maybe you had a reference pitch. And sometimes I try to play maybe a reference pitch along with these. I had challenges, though, really coming up with the intervals. The tricky thing also is don't assume that every transcription you're getting from a music archive or a library, a listening library, is going to be in a Western tonal system. So if it's not a 12-tone system... How do you transcribe that? And that's one of the purposes of a class like this is to really challenge assumptions of a Western notion that we have a staff here with 12 notes, with sharps and flats, different key signatures, different time signatures, different meters. Don't assume that you can just take that and transcribe and score what you're listening to. Because if it's a microtonal approach to sound, 
or musical performance, um, you're going to have to really think about a different way of transcribing or notating that music. So it really does get you to the heart of thinking about what music even is and what performance is and how you can replicate that in a notational form or a transcription form. So these are just different versions of me trying to come up with the rhythms and sometimes I would transcribe just rhythms. If I had a dotted note or a syncopation, this is an accent mark, so the accent sometimes was, you know, if you're playing a rhythm, there's an accent on the downbeat on one, if you will, if I'm playing something in 4-4, so I would you know, note an accent there. But really challenging sometimes to just really work on the intervals. And then what we would do is we would turn on our work to our professor. Um, this was a transcription. And here he said on here, um, you didn't note any accents. You didn't talk about the form or the dynamics. So my transcription wasn't great because I just really worked on some of the pitches and he circled some of these thinking like, yeah, maybe those aren't the exact pitches. And then the concern was that, um, and there was a drum playing, and I believe in this case also a glass sound. So there was like different percussion playing along with a children, uh, children's choir, a children group singing. So I was really trying to get the pitches, and I, I think I did a good job on the rhythm, at least of the different rhythms. This is a repeat. It means just this rhythm repeats over and over again. But as he was pointing out here, I didn't do any accents. So if there were accents like I was just doing here, I'd want to notate those on my transcription. The form, was the form appropriate? Did I discuss or analyze the form here? I kind of did. Again, when you listen to music, sometimes you could uh, figure out that it's 4-4 and you could figure out the key. But in other cases, again, it may not fit into a Western tonal or rhythmic system. When you deal with polyrhythms, you're, you're getting into different meters and competing um, rhythms that again may not notate effectively in um, a traditional transcription approach. And then also dynamics. So if um, the sound of the choir got louder or softer, you could notate that. And you know that there is a way to notate um, kind of like an arrow that's open up like this, what we call a crescendo or a decrescendo, which is the opposite, kind of a triangle um, going from uh, loud to soft. And that's actually a great example there of a crescendo mark and a decrescendo of a musical notation form that actually kind of looks like what it is, the sound, and we often don't see that. When you look at something like a C or an F here on um, a score, on, on a piece of notation here in a transcription, you know, there's nothing that tells you the frequency of that note. You could indicate that, but typically you don't. So it's another reminder also that sometimes sound and musical notation are in different worlds, unfortunately. If there's a, um, a song being uh, sung, uh, you know, sometimes I also try to indicate that. I would just write it out initially and try to have the verses listed here if it had a particular form like an ABA or ABACA or something like that. If you know, a lot of pop songs often have a form where you have verse and chorus. The verse is there and then the chorus. And you come back to the verse and, and, and then you do the chorus again and variations of it. So this just shows you all the different types of transcriptions we worked with. Apache songs, um, an Irish song, the Ballad of Nakanor. That was a really nice one, I remember. And again, every time we were given different challenges and we often were sometimes given actual, if you will, correct versions of the main melodies. And those of you that work with fake books, fake books are pretty cool because they will give you the key melody of something. And these are kind of cool because fake books will show you the main melody. And in some cases, you're trying to get the main melody of a song. So this will just give you, for example, the chords and the chord changes. Now, one of the curious things, and there are better fake books as well, this is like tablature, so this would be really good for, say, guitar players. Um, take the A Train, classic there. Um, this is actually a King Crimson fake book, which someone worked on. So it has the main melodies, and uh, you know, if you know the song Talk to the Wind, you could kind of play it out. Now, what's interesting about fake books is sometimes the, the melodies or the chords aren't quite right. And that could be because of copyright issues, the fact that maybe the song is not in the public domain, and if the songbook is owned by a company, if they want to publish maybe that song in its most accurate form, if you will, they're going to have to pay a ton in terms of royalties. But a fake book really reminds me of some of the work that we were doing in the transcription class, because very often we were trying to find the main melody 
and then use that melody for our um, analysis of, of the particular song. So I just really appreciated this approach because it really forced you to look at music and transcription, both the concept and kind of the technological or functional side of things together. And I just really appreciated that. This is another example of a song called Loop de Lou. And, you know, sometimes we had to transcribe all of the text and we had to do it in a verse format. Do not include the hand claps. Make a key for the signs you use to indicate deviations from standard pitch centers and so forth. So it was kind of cool, again, to work on some of these and to really think about how can I transcribe this in a way that's going to make sense for the next person. Now, we also have to do final projects, a um, little bit different, but similar to the final projects you're doing in this class this term. So we, it was really wide open for us, and I'll just show you a few of the projects just to give you a sense of what people looked at. We had one individual, his name was Joe, who was a great drummer, and he was way into um, the uh, work of uh, Getty Lee, Alec Leifson, and also Neil Peart from the band Rush. And so here he took Red Barchetta and then um, transcribed it and really came up with ways of looking at formulas of different fills that were used. And again, uh, this was a really transcription heavy project where he was interested in notating everything and then also had symbols for hi-hat, ride cymbal, and so forth. And some of these are standards. You know, for every form of tablature or music notation out there, whether it's guitar tablature or woodwind instrument tablature, or rather notation, rather it wouldn't be tablature, or um, drum notation, there are key symbols that are used. And you know, a lot of times, in drum notation, unless you have something like a, a tom, which is pitched, or a timpani, um, some drums are not pitched per se. If you have a ride cymbal or a hi-hat, you can tune a lot of your drums, of course, to get them dialed in where you want, but you're not typically thinking when someone's playing a bass drum of its pitch. And that's because it's a, a, a percussion instrument, so thus the notation often is pure rhythm and has no interest in pitch until you get into chimes, um, again, a timpani, uh, toms, wh where you are concerned with, with the pitch of those drums. This is another interesting work where the uh, student was interested in looking at heavy metal music and trying to come up with the, a genre distinction of different heavy metal music, and then also did some work with looking at um, using, again, primitive music software they ha that we had at the time on a Mac that allowed you to look at what grooving was considered. And this is kind of key because then you could look at whether or not something falls on the um, the beat, if it's a downbeat, if it's like something happening on two and four or one and three. And you can kind of see how groove might develop when someone is playing not exactly in time with the beat. And by the way, if you like software like this, I really recommend that you check out the free Audacity program, which I use literally seven days a week for just adjusting levels. But if you're interested doing anything with field recording or exploring technology, you can import a WAV file or an AIFF file into this free software and do all kinds of cool stuff. And it's, it's really interesting because it's a free version and a more sophisticated version of what we are working with here back in the late 80s and the 90s. And this is another student also working with technology and transcription, so a particular Irish jig, and then trying to look at how this is uh, played using a, um, I believe it was a, a penny whistle in this particular performance of this Irish jig. And again, talking about how you could y combine the transcription notation on staff uh, paper with actual sonic analysis looking at the waveforms. And this, this is a good example actually of combining sound and music in one project. Now here's the project I worked on and it's an experimental piece of music and in a little past midterm in this class we'll do work on noise and also experimental avant-garde music. So this is one of those forms it's a piece by Nelson Howe called Fur Music, and it involves actually playing on fur. And uh, it's very unique because you don't traditionally think of fur um, being something that uh, is an instrument. And this is why I chose it for my project. I thought this is going to be really cool because the performers can be musicians or non-musicians, and they'll be really forced to think critically about what music and sound even are. And that's why I loved using this piece. And this shows you a little bit about it. It talks about using your fingers and the different directions. And there are symbols, actually, that go along with it. 
and I think I included those, uh, they're down here. And so left, right, back and forth, rotary, up, down, soft, medium, the type of touch and the speed. So there were some um, directions given to the performer and uh, it was really though open to interpretation. So what I wanted to do was to actually record. So using my sound recording equipment, I recorded all the performances and I put my microphone, I used an old microphone that was a flat plane microphone right under this and I really cranked the gain up so that I could hear the playing and then people rubbed their hands on the fur and so I recorded it. I eventually transcribed what I recorded for each performer. These are the transcriptions and then I also did an interview so I asked people a series of questions and they had to talk about what they thought of it and this person was really confused and said they didn't like it and uh, you know they, they were confused by the whole process which is I think one of the points of avant-garde music is sometimes it's trying to challenge what you know about sound or music and in this case the concept of it it was really key to kind of getting you to think about what music is and what sound happens to be as well. So I did a transcription for each person as they went through the particular section of the score, which is also the instrument, which is kind of cool and trendy, because in a sense, this is the score simultaneously, the transcription, and is the actual instrument that you're performing on. So super conceptual at that level. The challenge for me, again, there were no pitches involved. So I just used like drum notation, but I was really challenged with like tempo and rhythm. Because again, you could say, well, the person is playing a 16th note. You could say, that's a 16th note. Well, actually, th those could be whole notes. Those could be half notes. Those could be quarter notes or eighth notes because we don't know what the tempo was. We don't have a time signature or a meter to go on. So I was really challenged because I thought whatever I do is going to be relative to each performer. So transcription three is different and unique from transcription four because I did not use a metronome. Now if I timed it and if I had a click track that would really take away from the intentions of what Howe was getting at in this piece. It's not about click tracks and perfect time and time signatures and 4-4 you know, versus 3-4. It's really about the performer interpreting and understanding this new approach to music and sound using fur and not necessarily thinking of even hearing it. Because even though you could hear some of the sound as I crank the gain on my microphone underneath the score and the sheet, um, it's really not a performance. Like if you're playing a wind instrument, you as a performer can hear that instrument being played. In this case, it's, it's a totally different aesthetic approach and formalistic technique, if you will, of performance. So for me, it was really hard, and I said, okay, I'll try to do in my own perception, you know, if something has a syncopation here, and you get into a lot of these odd rhythms that people are playing, if it's very steady and someone was doing like a steady beat, and I felt like relative to their performance and my sense of time or their sense of time, and what I thought could be the tempo, even though the tempo was never established, I might have notated something as a quarter note versus a 16th note or a dotted note. Um, again, syncopation came up here, and I also sometimes indicated time and some notions of dynamics or if it was slower or faster, just as a way to try to deal with the ambiguities of notating a performance that from the beginning is very strange and experimental and different and also really isn't intended to be transcribed per se. And that, that for me was really unique working through this piece. And these are the different transcriptions I, I worked with. And then this these are kind of my conclusions. And what we did at the end of, of the quarter, not unlike what we'll be doing in this class is we did final presentations to the entire class. We went to the professor's home and we presented everything. And actually I remember I was scheduled to present and everyone kept going because some people had to go home early. We never actually got to mine and unfortunately the class didn't get to see it and I actually presented it to the professor um, in his office. And it was kind of disappointing. So that's why I really want us in this class to present our work to one another. You have two options. You could do a live Zoom session for me and other students available to attend or you can learn Canvas Studio here available on your Canvas class and record it uh, for us. Turn that in as a recorded video on Canvas Studio and then I'll analyze it and other uh, students in the class will also look at and maybe uh, give you some feedback and commentary on your work. 
So that was my transcription analysis class, and I haven't looked at this literally going back to the 80s. Um, and it's pretty uplifting because it just reminds me of how remarkable this class was and how great it was to work at the Archives of Traditional Music and to take classes in the graduate program as an undergraduate at Indiana University. Now, when you look at some of the media for this week, you're going to get some great insights about some of these topics. Check out all these videos on ethnomusicology and how ethnomusicologists work. You can look at like this fan video, which I think is very ethnomusicological. When we talk about fan cultures later in the quarter, heavy metal parking lot, which is exactly what it says. And uh, again, just really look at these ethnomusicology lectures because I think they're super unique and will express to you what ethnomusicologists do today as compared to what folks were doing in the late 80s. Now, if you want to do field recording in this class, you know, ethnomusicologists certainly use field recorders. There's a slew of these online. You can get something like the Tascam DR05X, which I have for 129 bucks. You can also get high-end versions like the Zoom recorders that allow you to do multi-track recording, which will do stuff like my mixer over here, but in a much smaller format. You can often use the built-in mics, you can plug in a microphone, you can get an adapter to use various types of mics, you can plug in uh, a set of your favorite headphones to listen to what you're recording or the playback of it. You can also use a cell phone. I often say that you don't have to buy a fancy recorder to do field recording. Cell phones have wonderful technologies. I have an iPhone and it has something called voice recorder and it's amazing. And the sound quality is a little less, I would say, and more inferior to one of these. But if you get a nice external mic that plugs in, you can often clip that on someone if you're doing interviews, what's called a lavalier mic. Um, you can get fancier, of course, recording here and get really good audio quality running into a mixer, but I'm not expecting any of you to get any of this equipment for the class. However, if you want to do a project on field recording or, or archives of music, you might think about some of this technology at least to consider it uh, in your analysis. If you want to record field recordings as well, that could be a really cool project and we could talk offline about all the technology available for you to do some of that. So field recording is really key to doing work in ethnomusicology and in today's day and age, a lot of people are using video cameras or cell phone cameras so you can actually record pretty decent audio simultaneous with doing um, a video recording sometimes I'll actually put this uh, it has a, a mic thread or a quarter inch thread which is a camera thread I have a lot of different converters for these as well and I'll sometimes put this on a camera like this one here the black magic camera has pretty bad audio and it's one of the reasons I use external audio and then I sync this in post-production but it's another great thing to have a scratch audio track on your um, recording device doing video and then do a better version on another audio device if your recording a uh, video recording device doesn't have great audio so a lot to talk about there but if, if you want let's let's talk offline about this now you can also do something and check out work in field recording I've included the link this week for Alan Lomax's uh, amazing archives film video field work um, his work as a performer Lomax was such a revolutionary um, in, in so many fields of performance and ethnomusicology and sound collection. So check out some of the field recording opportunities here. You could do a great project on the same topic. Also, in terms of preservation, where I worked at the Archives of Traditional Music has a lot available in terms of field recordings. Some of this you can only work with um, in person at the archives. Other um, aspects of the collection are digitized. You can also go to the Library of Congress. The Folklife Collection is really wonderful from everything from text to photographs to audio recordings to film and video recordings. What's cool about the Archives tr Traditional Music, it is interested in preserving um, all the music possibly that it, it can gather and, and curate and archive. And as you can see here, it's one of the largest university-based ethnographic sound archives in the US. I believe when I was working there, it was the largest university sound archive. Library of Congress, of course, is super big and huge. So definitely check out the website. Um, you can learn more about what a sound archive is. And in addition to the performance space that we had, and I've mentioned in previous work that I worked at the archives, I performed there, I did a lot of recording for the archives in their noon concert series. And one of the interesting anecdotes about field recording that, that comes up for me is I would, you know, I had this giant, it's called a four track recorder. I had multiple microphones set up and I actually did some pretty cool work with getting almost like quadraphonic sound where I can really pan the sound in different parts of the room. So I might have a microphone set up here, one here, 
one here and so forth. So I did a lot with like spatial audio just because of my field recorder was able to record four tracks simultaneously. And then I would mix those down later. Well, the kind of the curious story about this is in a couple of cases, I added like reverb or chorus or a little EQ or equalization in my mix down because I thought it's going to make the, the sound pop a little bit in the performance. I kid you not, one of the performers went to the directors of the archive um, and said, hey, you know what, this has to go back. I'm really offended that he um, did this recording, this mix down, and he added reverb. And I said, it's no problem. I'll go back. I had the master tapes, which I which I kept, and I eventually deposited through the um, archival process. And that itself is really unique, where you have to do a lot of filling out of paperwork, and then you turn your media in. Um, I actually did that for quite a bit. Every single concert I recorded, they took the cassette tapes and they stored them in the archives. So those were the masters if they ever needed them. And then I also had a two-track or two-channel mixed down stereo audio that I provided to them. So in this case where the person was really offended by me adding reverb, I said to the director, no problem, I'm going to go back, I'll mix this down again. And I wanted to say to the performer, look, you know, I'm doing this on a volunteer basis basis and I'm happy to fix it for you. I didn't mean to offend you. Um, I, in, in retrospect, you know, I should have not add, added so much reverb to the performance. But you know, the acoustics of the room, which we'll get into as we talk uh, in, in later weeks here about performance setting, it often does um, impact um, actually, we're going to talk about it this week. Sorry, I, I just realized we're talking about this in, in week four as well. But the performance setting often impacts how you think about the mix down, the recording. Um, any of you that have worked with recording engineers or been to recording studios, the politics of a mix is crazy. I won't mention the bands, but I've been in bands before where people almost got into fist fights because it's like the guitar part isn't loud enough. The drums are too loud. They're too soft and all this kind of stuff. And at some point you want to just tell people just shut up already and put your egos aside because, you know, it's not a life or death, death decision how loud your guitar solo is in the mix. But for some people, you know, particularly with performers with big egos, they're unable to think about this stuff critically and say, well, maybe I shouldn't be so emotional. But again, the other side of it is like this performer at the Archives of Traditional Music, he or she, I forget, they were really upset with the mix. So the mix itself, the technology being used, how you approach the spatialization of sound uh, as it um, you know, will um, appear to you, if you will, sonically, in your headphones is a huge key part of, of the kind of stuff we're talking about. The preservation of the music itself is another key aspect. I've mentioned in other videos that the archives has everything from records to cassettes to videos to digital files, as well as what are called wax cylinders, which are some of the earliest forms of doing recording. And actually, cool story, when I went into the archives, into the actual holdings area, there were sections of it that the recordings were so valuable that they were both alarmed and um, hooked up with gas, like sleeping gas, that if you tripped it, you know, if someone broke in, it would, I guess, knock you out and uh, you wouldn't be able to steal the uh, very valuable collections. So really, really important stuff, right? Because you're trying to preserve this music for longevity for the future. And uh, Wax Cylinder is you know, um, actually a, a technology maybe that's going to last a little longer than a cassette tape. And actually one of the challenges we'll talk about later in the quarter with technology is that the magnetic life of certain types of tape, whether it's a videotape or a cassette tape, might be 7, 20, 30 years, depending on, on the format, but um, it's a huge issue of preservation. So you have to think about what media or form of technology is going to be most appropriate to save that sound for the longest period of time. The one that will never die out until we have a nuclear winter or you know the sun turns into a red giant and we're no more on this planet would be a digital file. Again, you can do an audio recording, take out the SD card as long as you save a backup copy of that and as long as your computer doesn't burn and crash or delete all your files, you will never lose that. Whereas a cassette tape is a really bad format because over time the magnetic format on it starts to erode if you will and then over time that sound decays and eventually you lose it completely. Those old VHS tapes that you sometimes see on TV shows if that's the best version they have unless they do a ton of correction which is really challenging to do 
um, you're often left with with those very blurry or those um, kind of uh, artifact lines on tapes. And by the way, speaking of technology, a lot of folks doing work in sound and video today are now using artificial intelligence. I have some friends that do film work, and they will use artificial intelligence, particularly programs like Isotope or companies like Isotope that has have various programs like Neutron 3, which I personally use in my own work for mastering. Um, Artificial intelligence is pretty amazing. You can actually, you know, record a clap, and if it's in a big hall that has a ton of natural reverb, you can de-reverb it. It's pretty amazing the algorithms and technology and artificial intelligence that can be used to do a lot of post-production work. But preservation of music really key to talking about ethnomusicology. Now, the last topic we can consider would be music and performance settings. And really, I'm intending by this like, where do you perform the music? And what does that say about the music, about its form, and so forth? You can check out the encyclopedia article, and it's intentionally a little dry. I just wanted to give you a flair of what is considered in terms of saying the music performance setting. So check out that article if you want to get more insights. So I was kind of jumping back to my own performance settings to remember everything I've done. And again, it's just very eclectic. Experimental music, marching bands, solo recitals, choirs, which you don't really want to hear me sing. It's not my favorite. Pop bands, uh, jazz bar combos, um, sax quartets, cruise ship performances, etc. And as I've talked about in the past, it's a pretty eclectic history ranging from pop music to um, more like traditional classical music, experimental music, uh, wrote an opera, scored that, industrial music, um, experimental multimedia performance groups, and uh, more um, uh, progressive rock bands, uh, blues band, solo performances. And then today, this is what I'm really working with is more like experimental electronic music, electroacoustic music, which I'll get into in a couple weeks when we talk about homemade instruments, because quite a bit of this features homemade instruments. And then again, some of my media that I share online on various uh, social media sites and also uh, sites like Spotify and iTunes. So a lot of different settings to think about, and I'll just tell you from all these experiences, all these make me think of music and sound in different ways. The way you approach sound, playing in a sax quartet, and the music and your intonation is so different if you're playing in a um, you know in a combo in a jazz bar where people are drinking and having fun and you're not so worried about perfect intonation um, and you're doing some maybe more um, uh, you know um, outlandish or kind of experimental things. So each context of a performance has like a different approach or um, consideration as a performer and as an audience member. So it's it's I think really interesting to think about this as we move from one setting to the other. I actually want to add here, I was just thinking as we're going through that list there, I need to add to my list here of genre. So the next slide here is talking about what we might consider in music and performance settings. So the space of it itself, is it a large hall? Is it a very small intimate space? Maybe it's headphones. You actually can go to concerts where you can uh, get an like an MP3 player, put on headphones, and listen live all together simultaneously. It's kind of like these, um, do they call them like a live disco or something like that? But it's pretty cool because you're using headphones, and we don't traditionally think of headphones being used for um, a simultaneous live performance. So things like the media itself, what kind of media is connected to the performance? Is it live or pre-recorded? What's the purpose of it? The technology, the acoustics of the sound hall itself or the setting is huge. Um, the mix, if you've been to good and bad concerts, I can tell you um, I heard Dream Theater, the, the progressive metal band here in, in Reno, one or two occasions. And an amazing band and incredible players from their guitarist to their singer, their bass player, their drummer, their keyboardist. Um, but the mix was really tricky, right? Or I should say the mix wasn't great. And it was really bass heavy. It was too loud. Um, I had um, my kind of musicians um, earplugs in, which are really recommended to you if you want to save your ears. They basically act as 
uh, low pass filters. So what that means is the high frequencies are filtered out. So a lot of that screechy sound you might hear in a club going to an EDM, although in EDM you hear a lot of bass sound that's like really bass heavy um, in terms of that, that rhythm and trying to create like almost out of body experiences with the music. But this particular concert was really treble heavy and so it helped a little bit having those musicians earplugs, but the mix was not great. And so the technology really does affect the performance setting, the music, the sound, and so forth. Obviously the instruments, if you hear a string quartet versus a heavy metal band versus a punk band, those all are going to affect you in different ways. Um, the other thing I would add to this would be, um, I'm, I'm doing this on the fly here, and I was thinking like emotions and mood are also key to a lot of performances. Again, it kind of connects all these together, the genre and so forth. And then the psychology itself, I think, is really key to a music performance, what you get out of it, how the musicians psychologically relate to it, um, any fear or nervousness you might have as a performer very early on when I was first like doing music back in middle school. I remember like doing a performance, it was really scary. And nowadays when I do something, it's like much different and I just don't feel a lot of fear about getting on stage or sharing my music with a live audience or even in pre-recorded settings. And then I think marketing is also something we think about with a lot of big bands or acts today. Sometimes it's less about the music and it's about the marketing. It's about the image, the dancing that goes on, the multimedia that goes along with the actual music itself. So I just encourage you to think this week about performance setting along with these issues of ethnomusicology and field methods and research. If any of these topics connect with you, definitely consider any of these or one of these rather specifically for a final project in this class. So uh, that is it for week four ideas. I'll be back next week with additional ideas and as well I will often intersperse some musical performances and discussions of sound as much as I can utilize some of the gear here in the studio. So thanks for listening and I'll be back shortly with another video.